uh, tell us all the things you should never do with Terraform. Thank you. Okay, now you can hear me. Anyway, thank you, Walter, for the introduction. And uh, yes, in fact, there will be some things which uh, you should not do, but at least you should be aware that they exist. So maybe you have this actual situation when you should be doing it. So a uh, couple words. Oh, my God. Of course, it never works in this room. So this time without clicker again. Uh, what I do? Uh, I'm uh, staying pretty really active in open source community uh, and I'm writing and maintaining a lot of open source tools related to Terraform, AWS, and uh, I became AWS community hero because I actually do something in the community, giving talks and trying to figure out how to make uh, usage of AWS and Terraform. Uh, first uh, question to uh, all of you, please raise your hand if you are using Terraform AWS modules. Excellent, oh my god. That's actually much more. So it means that some people went to previous year talk as well. Because in previous year, I talked about Terraform best practices and how to use it properly. And honestly, I am tired of using it the uh, correct way. OK, so this time we will look into how to, uh, to not use or how you can use. And uh, this should give you some information about uh, possibilities. And. Uh, yeah, uh, what I do, uh, I actually do everything related to Terraform, consulting and providing uh, different services, running workshops, trainings, and uh, I also like mentorship. I mean, I'm exposed to a lot of different code and solutions, which I try to aggregate and uh, sometimes talk about them. Uh, you can uh, see my blog where I write exclusively about Terraform and AWS on antonbabenka.com. And uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, stuff which uh, most of you, as I understand, are using, which is pretty cool. Uh, there were 7 million downloads so far, and uh, I'm sure that amount will be just increasing because, uh, come on, so far just 1,000 uh, pull requests and issues resolved, right? So we need more issues, more pull requests, more users, and more sponsors. So there is a link. Um, Another project which I'm involved is Cloudcraft, which is opinionated and pretty good way of drawing AWS diagrams in the browser. Uh, I have 25 minutes and I have 66 slides left, so we have to go fast, okay? Uh, what I'm working on is that uh, once you visualize something in the browser, uh, you don't have to repeat yourself when you actually implement this as code. So Modules TF is an open source project which I work on uh, you can go and use it for free and see what kind of code and structure and uh, tools are actually used. So infrastructure. Infrastructure is all what is necessary to uh, run an uh, uh, application. It's all kind of computing, networking, and other requirements which we have to maintain. So this is my favorite definition of infrastructure, despite the fact that this is not coming from Wikipedia. And Terraform, uh, I'm not going to ask uh, who used Terraform because, I mean, otherwise you would go to another talk. Mm -hmm. um, plan, disclaimer, uh, everything what I'm going to talk uh, will probably uh, look, uh, oh my God, why do you even show this? Uh, I don't really care because this is disclaimer, okay? And uh, uh, there are a lot of things, a lot of features of Terraform which exist in documentation in user's code, but it doesn't mean that they are good. For example, Terraform workspaces. And uh, there will be some useful parts as well in the talk. Uh, I put them in the beginning so that you actually get something useful first, and then you uh, figure out that, oh my god, Terraform can be used as a hammer, because everything except, uh, I don't know, is a nail, right? So let's use Terraform for absolutely crazy situations. And then we'll look uh, into how Terraform 012 actually helps and what does it do. And how cool is it? So first add, of course, and let's make Terraform with AWS faster for free with SMS and registrations, right? Who doesn't like to have it? So please use this one. You'll be surprised that if you specify in the provider that you can skip credential validation, check uh, which region you are using, metadata API check, and all of this, you will have, in most cases, you will have at least uh, uh, one no, so you will have one uh, instead of uh, 10 API calls. And if you are working on slow network, uh, like an air, airplane, this helps a lot. 
you can work with Terraform offline using these hacks. And this is documented, so this is not hack, this is useful, okay? Uh, a little bit more practical stuff, uh, versioning and secrets. I mean, everybody uh, likes to deal with secrets, I know, so we'll talk about that. But first, versioning. So versioning in Terraform exists in many places, in many flavors. We have Terraform Core, which uh, obviously has to be version 0.12. something. Providers, uh, many from the community, uh, now you can get them from the registry. And uh, a lot of them are in private because nobody wants to publish them. And uh, also there are modules which are more uh, obvious way and more obvious things to be versioned. Uh, most of them are in registry, some of them are private, and so on. So when we are talking about versioning in Terraform, uh, of Terraform Core itself, there are not many tools which are useful and helpful. For example, if you need to run Terraform on your local machine, TFN is one of these tools which you run uh, and switch uh, similar as you do with RubyN, for example. Uh, if you have to uh, specify version of Terraform as well as version of providers, that's a really good thing that you're starting to uh, uh, look at your code as something what will actually live longer than you quit, right? So you're uh, worried about future. And uh, the point of uh, versioning of Terraform providers is that uh, when you specify your dependencies and uh, they will be combined later on and uh, you cannot override them from the parent modules which you use. That's why uh, good Terraform modules are never using uh, provider block inside of module itself. Uh, always instantiated uh, at the highest level. And uh, uh, there are many tools uh, which try to do similar stuff for modules. Honestly, all of them failed, in my opinion, uh, even the one which I'm talking about now. Because it worked uh, on October, now it doesn't work. Uh, the point is that it is really hard to make versioning correct. Um, for example, as it says here, support ranges for modules from Terraform registry seems to be the case uh, if the latest digit is less than, uh, than uh, nine. 10 uh, is not more than 9, according to this tool. <laughs> so I was surprised. Mm. And uh, it, overall, uh, the flow looks like that, is that we first set up version for the Terraform, then we figure out which version of provider of modules we need to do, and then we use Terraform init to download providers which satisfy modules requirements which we have. And then we use Terraform as normally, Terraform plan, apply, and destroy. If you are into automation and CI, CD things, you may look into uh, Dependabot, uh, which still has an uh, ongoing issue related to Terraform 0.12 syntax, but from what I understand, it will be resolved uh, sooner or later because the amount of uh, disappointed people is growing very fast. Uh, you can go there and uh, upvote it yourself. Uh, secrets in Terraform. It's still a problem with Terraform 0.12, uh, not a big surprise. Uh, Terraform Core uh, has not done everything what is necessary, but let's see what we can do. So first of all, there are two types of secrets which we're talking about. The first one is uh, inside of plan, apply, and output. And then the second one, which is still this, uh, no changes at all, is uh, Terraform state. So whatever you put will be in state. Uh, first of all, when we specify uh, that we want to uh, output password, uh, we may specify that we want to use sensitive true, then it will be uh, uh, written as sensitive. Pretty uh, good and pretty helpful sometimes. Uh, if we want to use actually a random string and uh, we want to generate this random <coughs> password and then we use it somewhere else, uh, quite recently uh, there was a new resource which is called random password. And the cool part of it is that uh, it does not output ID of the password itself uh, as console output, which means that we can run it in CI and uh, it will not be available for anyone else. So check out a uh, random password resource. And uh, overall, uh, the solutions are very specific to the provider, and if we are talking about uh, AWS, there are a lot of options uh, related to the provider implementation of how to deal with secrets and how to encrypt them somewhere. Uh, it, is, uh, it is pretty big uh, topic in general. So if you have uh, some money, let's say from zero to $70, uh, you may uh, get benefit from Terraform Cloud and uh, you will be able to have secrets uh, uh, managed uh, using Terraform Cloud 
and uh, your state file will be also stored uh, on Terraform Cloud. So you actually will not have so much problem with secrets, but this is only if you have some money. If you don't have money, uh, you can use tool like Secret Hub. Uh, I think it is one of the best tool out there. I'm surprised that uh, not many people are talking about it, including uh, employees. I don't know why, but I'm telling you that this is cool. So uh, check it out. It has support for TFRs, TF state. It's uh, another resource. Uh, it's another provider in Terraform uh, which you have to include, and it will be uh, dealing uh, with secrets. Uh, so secret hub uh, is documentation. So overall, uh, versioning is doable. Secret is still problem. Secret hub looks good. Okay, that was the end of useful information. Okay, now let's look about uh, what is uh, actually Hammer, right? I mean, Hammer looks cool, right? <laughs> we, uh, we know that Terraform is powerful. Let's use for pretty much anything. Uh, what means anything? So let's manage uh, resources but don't care about state. And uh, what does infrastructure glue Terraform mean? And uh, how to manage any resource on AWS uh, uh, using Terraform? and how to do application deployment, and how to actually uh, use uh, dynamic Terraform modules, and what does actually Scheme means. So let's uh, look in the first problem, how to create resources and don't worry about their state. If you are coming from infrastructure, you, like infrastructure management, you get used to there is resource, there is configuration or definition, there is state, and we have to take care about this TF state file very carefully because we don't want to lose it. It's really sensitive and it's all these scary things. In most cases, it's right. But what about if we want to use Terraform for just write only operations? Uh, or, for example, we have some tooling which uh, allow us to generate Terraform uh, configuration files, and we want to manage data which we populate console key value or we just want to upload and overwrite uh, any amount of uh, files on S3, or any other reason. There, there are a lot of different reasons. Uh, I'm putting this uh, as an example. Yes, there is a backend type called inmem. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot put link to documentation because documentation doesn't exist and uh, nobody wants you to use it. So. <laughs> Uh, I encourage you to check this out. It's really helpful if you are creating something what you don't want to worry about. For example, it's your test environment which you not, certainly will never touch anymore. So that's a great example of uh, using InMem. It will make your uh, uh, work with Terraform faster. Of course, so there is no state, so every time there will be uh, creation of resources, there is no way to change them, but in many cases it helps. Infrastructure glue Terraform. Well, uh, some time ago we figured out that a lot of APIs exist. Uh, Terraform has a unified way to manage all of them. Like uh, you can manage resources uh, on your file system to create them, to read, create archives or call different scripts, CLIs, REST API, make HTTP calls, and many, many different things. And uh, I see uh, not many people are actually taking it uh, seriously because what, what it gives you is you have a way to interact with these uh, APIs or with these uh, uh, providers uh, in very uh, standardized way. For example, uh, this code shows that we can connect different type of resources and uh, create files, make an archive uh, for them and upload this archive into S3 bucket. So first of all, we use uh, features of Terraform 012 to iterate through list and make list of users, for example. And then we make uh, files uh, in specific location on our file system. And then we make an archive uh, from that directory and we upload this archive into S3 bucket. So all of this is 24 lines, which of course can be uh, uh, updated and you can use uh, CLI or AWS CLI or you can use uh, any other tool, or you can write shell script in one line, but the point is that uh, of this talk is not to show that, hey, the same you can do in better way. No, Terraform can do this. So, how to manage any type of AWS resource? If you are coming from AWS, you know CloudFormation, right? Many people know CloudFormation. 
Okay, uh, CloudFormation does not support a lot. Like, it doesn't support everything. And Terraform does not support everything either, but uh, in total, they support pretty much everything. If not everything, then you have two options. You have to open pull request to AWS provider and then wait and wait and wait. Meanwhile, you have to use your own fork. And I'm quite sure that there are people who open pull requests to Terraform AWS provider and uh, you are still waiting for pull requests to be merged, right? Yeah, I can see some faces. So yes, it takes some time. It takes some time and uh, meanwhile you have to use your own fork. But uh, even worse situation is when you have some stuff developed uh, in CloudFormation uh, because that's default in AWS back then, uh, even still now. And uh, you want to move to something else, but uh, you was told that, oh, you cannot to delete this database or S3 bucket. So what can you do uh, so that you have to use uh, better tools, but uh, you at the same time cannot recreate resources? This is where the requirement is. If you could create uh, and delete, that's easy. So the solution for that one is that you first create CloudFormation stack and you specify a deletion policy retain. So you have a CloudFormation stack where deletion policy retain means that uh, this resource will not be deleted uh, after CloudFormation stack uh, is deleted. This means that it's not managed by anything else, literally. Then you delete uh, CloudFormation stack and you import this uh, retained resource to Terraform. Uh, it, looks, it looks like uh, this is that you have to write uh, code describing these resources, like in this case, S3 bucket, and you have to import it and you have to uh, see that plan is happy because you uh, customize the resource configuration and there is nothing else to change. So what you have now is that uh, resource uh, is uh, managed <coughs> using Terraform and it does not have any relation with CloudFormation anymore. And uh, if there are some situations which you cannot manage uh, using uh, CloudFormation or using Terraform, you can still use null resource and uh, AWS CLI. <laughs> AWS CLI still supports significant amount of resources, uh, even registration domains, if you want. And yeah, of course, it's never too late. So application deployment. I have a little bit of time and uh, I want to ask you, what was before? I mean, on this conference, you've heard about immutable infrastructure more than once. You all know what is Packer, Docker, Schmocker. Uh, there are many different tools out there. Uh, but what was before? Like, who tell, like, how did you do before all of this? Let's say, maybe in some places you still do it, like I did, uh, and I still do it for some of projects. Uh, so what is, like, Anyways, how you do this. Don't mention anything fancy like immutable. Of course, no, no Kubernetes, please. No Packer, Docker. SVG. What? SVG. Yeah, SCP. SCP is pretty cool, yeah. SCP is supported uh, quite successfully. That's too boring, I would say. <laughs> what about this one? Terraform and Git pool. Isn't it cool that you can use Terraform to actually use uh, remote execution to connect to, the ins to an instance which is not managed, of course, anywhere, and you run git pool on that machine. Isn't it future? <laughs> Hopefully not, but uh, still, you can describe this resource. You are kind of one way into, to, into 21st century, and uh, then you say, oh, no, now I need to redeploy this. So you run Terraform taint, you taint that resource, and you run a play apply again and then you run it again. Uh, I think it's brilliant because you are almost there. You start to understand that, oh yeah, there is a gap between this uh, process, but Terraform can bridge them. So, and uh, one of the most uh, complicated uh, feature, uh, or not even feature, but um, um, scenario, I would say, how to use Terraform uh, for things which kind of was not designed for. And this is uh, called, uh, like in web, web browser, it's called Polyfill, where Polyfill is code that uh, implements a feature of web browser that do not support the feature. Uh, in uh, terms of Terraform, uh, 
we all wanted to have something what uh, Terraform, uh, if we go to Terraform uh, open issues and we see that there are hundreds of upvotes or even some disappointed customers say like, oh, this feature is not supported, we cannot, we cannot use Terraform because it's, uh, it's too bad. What, what can we do for them? For example, for each with modules. Like, many people wanted to use it, I'm sure, because I go to GitHub issues and I see so many upvotes. Or even more, uh, like historically, uh, people wanted to have a reusable module, but they wanted to have different uh, values inside of ignore changes. For example, an auto-scaling group. I still have debate between people who say like, oh, we don't have to specify minimum, maximum, desired capacity as uh, uh, required values, because we wanted to have uh, up and down, like scale uh, in and scale out, but at the same time, uh, other group of people say that this has to be fixed. Uh, and uh, there is no way for me as a maintainer to specify that ignore changes can be parameterized based on what you need. Because uh, inside of lifecycle block, uh, I cannot use variables. Uh, actually, I cannot use variables in many other places. But in lifecycle ignore changes, uh, this is one of most obvious. Second example is prevent destroy uh, inside of lifecycle. We wanted to have uh, this optional. Like, now I'm entering pseudo mode. This means that prevent destroy should be false. OK, fine. So this feature is not supported in Terraform. Uh, I think it will be supported in the near future, to be honest. But uh, uh, we'll see. And another example is when we have uh, so-called self-service. Uh, this is a feature which I have hardest time to explain and uh, even figure out this myself, to be honest. But uh, I want to have module content to be based on the input to the module itself. Not just values of the m of resources has to be parameterized, but the content of the module itself. If we look into this module block, where we can see that uh, HTTPS myterraform.tf is actually a website where the source code of the module is generated based on uh, results submitted from the form. This means that uh, inside of uh, uh, zip archive, which is going to be produced by myterraform.tf, there will be content which is very unique. For example, I can Im embed some secret uh, stuff uh, based on uh, request uh, I receive, or I can generate infinite amount of combinations. I can use full features of uh, programming language. I can even use Pulumi to generate Terraform code inside of that uh, HTTP response if I want. But uh, the point is that uh, this is a place where we can add uh, so-called uh, scheme to the Terraform. If this was not enough, uh, uh, Sean from HashiCorp is a good guy. He published workshop puzzles. There are, I think, five of them, uh, which I didn't list here. You can go to that repository and try to solve them yourself, and you will see that uh, Terraform is a pretty cool tool to do uh, random stuff. When I say random, uh, I actually mean random. For example, you, you may uh, want to uh, orchestrate printers remotely using Terraform. I mean, yes, it has a, a HTTP interface, so Terraform can talk HTTP. So you see, it works. Um, and uh, I was told by one guy who actually do this for work because he works as a system administrator remotely. And uh, he says that uh, sometimes he has to do, like most of his job is with Terraform and proper usage of it, but also he has to do some IT stuff without going to, uh, to work, which is good. So Terraform 012, uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, please raise your hand if you are still using uh, 011 and uh, want to move uh, to 012, like immediately. Why this part of the room, really? <laughs> okay, I will ask this part of the room. Do you guys know what is 0.12? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah, I'll talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, uh, what does it mean for us? So there are at least two groups of people, uh, Terraform developers and Terraform users. And um, uh, the reason for this separation is uh, quite... Um, strict, I would say, is that uh, we don't have to expand the term of uh, full-stack developer even more. 
like uh, you knew HTML, uh, JavaScript, uh, PHP, now Java. Oh, there is DevOps, so DevOps as well, and Terraform as well. That's too much. There will be no quality. So if we, would, we will be constantly expanding this term, that's, uh, that's too bad. The quality will be not so good. What I believe in is that uh, there are a group of people, typically we call them as DevOps engineers. They know AWS, they know provider, they know some uh, company start, um, standards, they know security uh, to some degree, they know what is encryption, and they want to figure out how to connect different components together. So the end result from these guys should be uh, reference architecture which they uh, publish and uh, maintain inside of organization. And they actually use happily all features of Terraform 012. While Terraform users are, on another hand, just go into a wiki page and see what kind of solutions do we have in our organization. Like, how do we deploy this stuff? And they pick existing uh, module from the reference architecture published in organization, and they use it just to build whatever they need. They don't have to know all these uh, features about uh, Terraform, uh, Sheem, and crazy other things which uh, exist. They just need to get their job done. And for that, they just need to know basics of HCL2, which is uh, Terraform uh, 012. They already know how to build uh, stuff, and they know their, their domain area. So uh, my last slide here is that uh, Terraform 012 is great, and uh, there is no doubt that that's what we need, and we need this uh, for uh, for very many reasons, but uh, I don't want uh, to have even more people who are not dealing with Terraform on a daily basis to be so excited that, yes, now I will go to work and now I will make my code work in Ter uh, Terraform 012 and everything will be perfect. No, it will be crap, honestly. It will be crap because you need to understand a lot of internal implementations. Like, you need to know how to connect these things together so that you can actually live with them when uh, Terraform 013 comes out. And uh, yeah, Terraform uh, is a universal tool. I hope you uh, got this uh, impression. Uh, but uh, honestly, please evaluate and pick more uh, carefully than just listening to my talk. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. One question. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know why you don't like workspaces. Sorry? And I'd like to know why you don't like workspaces. It's so loud. Yeah. It's not going to work. It is so loud. This is for you. Yeah, I knew. This is a common question which people ask. Uh, we've just changed to using workspaces. Sorry? We've just, re we've just refactored our code to use workspaces. Oh, right.